I'm on my last recipe of make-ahead meals for my family, and this one is for breakfast. It's called a sleepin' in omelet, and it's named that for a reason. Basically, you whip this up, stash it in the fridge overnight, and then the next morning, you pop it in the oven, and you've got a hot, delicious breakfast without even lifting a finger. Now, the basis of the sleepin' in omelet is bread. I'm using ciabatta. This recipe was one that my mom and her friends used to make when I was growing up and they actually used onion rolls. That is really delicious, too. Basically, you can use whatever bread you have, French bread. I've even used bagels before, and that is delicious. Now, for this casserole, you've got to have cheese. I've got a hunk of sharp cheddar, and I'll just grate it up. I'll just sprinkle it over the bread. Now, the ingredient I absolutely love in this casserole is cream cheese. I'm just tearing off big chunks. It always results in deliciousness. Now, if that weren't decadent enough, I've got some butter cut into bits, and I'll just dot the top. It is so yummy. Now, this is basically a French toast casserole or a strata, which means you need an egg mixture to hold it all together. I've got 10 eggs that I beat up, and now I'll move forward with the mixture. So I'm going to whisk a couple of cups of milk into the 10 beaten eggs. Toss in two tablespoons of dehydrated onions, half a teaspoon of dried mustard, a dash of cayenne pepper, the same amount of salt, some pepper, a teaspoon of chopped chives for even more flavor, and whisk it all together. Now I'm just gonna get all this egg mixture poured on and then I'll cover it and pop it in the fridge overnight. But let me show you what happens to the sleeping in omelet tomorrow. Okay, it goes into a 325 degree oven for about 45 minutes. Then the foil comes off, the oven goes up to 350, and the casserole gets another 10 to 15 minutes. Then the sleeping in omelet is done and ready to be heaped onto plates for a hungry ranch crew, or a hungry city crew. And that's what I call a great breakfast. I think that's my plate. I'm making a hominy casserole. I just fried a bunch of bacon and took it out to drain. And I'm going to start cooking some onions. And those help make that casserole extra tasty. All right, while the onions start cooking, I'm going to dice up a couple of red bell peppers. And while they cook, I'll chop up the bacon. The onions and peppers look glorious. So I'll grab the hominy. I drained it and rinsed it really well. And it just goes right in. And then I have some half and half. Now I'm making two casseroles. Now I'll go in with some hot sauce and I'll just stir this around and let this slowly start to heat up. Cheddar and Monterey Jack, it's gonna go right into the pan. The bacon is all chopped and it goes in. A tiny bit of salt and pepper. I'm gonna pour this mixture into two iron skillets. I smeared the skillets with butter. Then I'll spread the mixture into the skillet. Now I'll get the rest of the cheese. Just give it a little sprinkle. And then I just have some plain breadcrumbs and I'll sprinkle those over just to give the whole thing a little bit of crunch. I'm gonna put the skillets into a 375 degree oven just for about 20 minutes or so until the tops are golden. These hominy casseroles are gonna be so yummy. Oh, this is a great dish. A butternut squash pasta casserole. It is so hearty and delicious. So to keep things easy, I'm adding a bag of butternut squash from the freezer. You can totally use fresh instead. And then in addition to the squash, I'm gonna add a quart of chicken broth, low sodium, and I'm cranking the heat because I want this to cook until the butternut squash is totally tender. This is a very fall-friendly recipe, but since you can buy butternut squash in the freezer section of the grocery store year-round, you can totally make this whenever you want. Whenever you want. Salt and pepper. Probably. Okay, so the butternut squash is gonna cook for five minutes until it's soft. Watch the magic happen. I'm gonna turn this into a squashy liquid. <laughs> Which is kind of strange. It doesn't sound all that good, but trust squashy me. Liquid, <laughs> And you can puree it as much or as little as you want to. You can make it a totally smooth puree, or it can be sort of a chunky puree. I like things with some texture. All right, just about done. I see some chunks of butternut in there, but I'm gonna leave them, because I think it'll make the casserole more interesting. 
Okay, so this is so cool because I'm actually gonna pull this casserole together in the casserole pan. So I already cooked some penne, and watch this. This is basically the liquid for the casserole, but it's just, it's kind of like a butternut squash mac and cheese, you know? It's gonna be delicious, trust me. Be great. Okay, and then I've got a few things to add. Some roasted red pepper, frozen peas, wow. and goat cheese. It kind of combines with the butternut squash and oh my gosh, the texture and the consistency of this casserole is amazing. Stirring it right in the casserole dish. And this pasta was actually kind of cooked to not quite al dente, so the extra liquid in the casserole will keep the casserole from becoming dry when it bakes, because the pasta is gonna keep absorbing some of that liquid. Oh. Ooh, so pretty so far. Now this is a really cool little ingredient to add. I grated cauliflower. So instead of using like a breadcrumb or something, I'm doing cauliflower and that makes it more veggie forward, more healthy. And then on top of the cauliflower, just for a little extra flavor, some salt and pepper. I love this casserole. And I love casseroles that you can assemble right in the pan. I don't have a whole bunch of different bowls that I'm mixing in. All right, now I've got a whole bunch of mozzarella since Paige was quick to point out that there wasn't enough cheese in this casserole. And then Parmesan, of course, on top of the mozzarella. Tons of different ingredients going on, but they're all very simple. And then parsley, and I'll save a little bit to sprinkle on at the end. I think this is gonna be amazing. What do you think? I think so. All right, let's get this in the oven. We're gonna bake it at 375 degrees for 40 to 45 minutes, and I am so sorry that you have to wait that long. Oh, actually, you don't have to wait that long. Look, 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 look. Wow. Oh my gosh. That looks incredible. Check it out, you guys. Wow, all that cheese. Wow, it looks so good. I think we need to serve it. Yes. Uh -huh. I think yes. we need to kind of try it. I think yeah. we need to enjoy it. Can I try? Yeah, are you excited to try this, Paige? I just love goat cheese. All right, Alex. Mom, I've okay. got, got to get sliced cam, or scoop cam. Oh, dear. Oh, my oh, gosh. No. It's basically, this is basically mac and cheese. <gasps> that took a trip around the world or something. Here, Paige, I'll let you try. Excited. Okay, one bite review. Trying to get all the good stuff. One bite review. Whoa, one bite. Oh, it smells so good. Mmm. 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 Really, really good. good. Great news. My mom and sister are coming over. I am so excited. And I thought that would give me the chance to make my mom's legendary seafood casserole. It is gloriously retro sinfully delicious, and it is so easy to make. I'm gonna start with the seafood. So I have a whole bunch of cooked shrimp that's chopped into little bits, and I'm gonna add some lump crab meat, and a little bit of decadence here, some lobster meat right out of the claw. Look at this, it's incredible. Honestly, you can use any combination of seafood that you want. This is the three that my mom always used for hers, but really anything goes. All right, I've also got some veggies to add. So some chopped green bell pepper, bunch of chopped celery, and some sliced green onion. And then I'll just stir this mixture of seafood and veggies until it's all mixed together. Oh, this casserole. How much do I love it? Let me count the ways. It is incredible and it reminds me of my childhood. My mom made this whenever she and my dad had friends over or some kind of dinner party. It's one of those casseroles that works for any kind of elegant dinner or a brunch. Alrighty, I got all of this mixed together. So now I'm gonna add some other scrumptious ingredients a bunch of mayonnaise. You know this recipe is from the 70s. 
when you see this amount of mayonnaise going in. <laughs> but this is basically the liquid of the casserole. And it's also what makes the casserole so incredible. And then a good spoonful of Dijon mustard or any sort of grainy mustard. And then just a little touch of sherry. This is optional. In fact, my mom's original recipe did not have sherry in it, but I have found with kind of creamy casseroles like this, just a little touch of sherry <laughs> gives it the most incredible flavor. And then of course, bringing it into the current day, dash of hot sauce. I don't think the original recipe had hot sauce. My mom might have had one teeny little bottle of one kind, but I'm glad we're in the hot sauce era of modern history. A few dashes of Worcestershire. And then for seasoning, I'm gonna add some Old Bay seasoning because it is a seafood casserole and Old Bay seasoning was made for seafood. And then salt, and you wanna add plenty of black pepper. A couple of good sprinkles. All right, now I've gotta mix all this together. I am so glad my mom and Betsy live close by now. My mom lived in Connecticut and Tennessee and even Texas for several years when the kids were growing up. But about three years ago, she and her husband, Doug, moved to Owasso, which is close to Tulsa. So it's so nice to have them close by. And then Betsy, she lives in Seattle, but she has been splitting her time between Pawhuska and Seattle. And it is incredible having her here. My favorite sister, my only sister, but she would still be my favorite even if I had 20 sisters. So now, the casserole goes into the casserole dish. Now look how creamy this is, but I would like to point out that there is no cheese in this casserole. What is the world coming to? What's gotten into me? I don't even recognize myself. And this is one of those things that actually gets better and better as it sits in the fridge. So there's no reason you can't assemble this in the morning when you're going to have it that evening and the flavors will just have even more of a chance to meld and marry and become more miraculous. So I'm gonna cover it with plastic wrap and then I'm gonna pop it in the fridge for an hour and then I'm gonna top it off and put it in the oven to bake it. While I'm here, I'm gonna grab this beautiful seafood casserole and get it ready for the oven. Okay, gotta roll up my sleeves for this one. So, I told you my mom used to make this in the 70s and this is a dead giveaway. I'm gonna top the whole thing with potato chips. Yeehaw! <laughs> These are just regular, straight up potato chips. Crushed, they're not like, finely crushed to a crumb. They're still in big chunks. And as you can see, I am being very, very generous. The recipe says one bag of potato chips. Never mind that bags of potato chips now are probably three times the size as they were in the 70s. But you know what? I like to follow instructions. It's the recipe's fault. All right, so I'm gonna put this into a 350 degree oven and I'll bake it for about 30 minutes until it's nice and bubbly. And next, I'm gonna make an appetizer that my mom and Betsy are gonna love. Okay. And mom, would you put the plates out? Yeah, I will. And I am gonna grab the casserole, which I'm very excited yeah. about. Mom, I think you're gonna recognize this. Oh. What is it? I haven't been told about the casserole. We'll just see if mom knows what it is. Oh, <gasps> no. Oh, yes. What? I know, <laughs> because of the potato chips. Oh, what is it, my mom? goodness. I may not have made that for the last decade, tw 20 years. <laughs> I don't well, know. What tell is me, it? make sure, you need to fact check me. Now, you made that in the 70s. Oh, yes. <laughs> I'm the youngest. I missed it. Seafood casserole. Salad. Here, I'm going to put some salad on your Thank plate. Thank you. Here, look at this, Bets. Look at that. Oh That's a gosh. lobster claw. Isn't Whoa. That gorgeous. Oh, gorgeous. I'll Please. serve you. Oh, sure. Thanks, Mom. Lobster. 
it's all seafood. It's shrimp, crab meat, and lobster mixed with a creamy mixture. <laughs> I'll give you a little parsley on yours. Mm. I'm just going for it. I am too. Oh my gosh, yeah. Oh. Mm -mm. This is a special. Yeah, this is a throwback. You know how you know this is a recipe from the 70s? How? Because <laughs> there's like a lobster claw and a potato chip <laughs> in the same bite. <laughs> Anytime I have a party or big family gathering, corn casserole is always on the menu. I learned how to make this from my mother-in-law and it is the most delicious side dish imaginable. I start by husking several cobs of corn and what I'm gonna do is just cut the end off so I have some support and then with a really sharp knife, I just slice down the cob and cut off the kernels. In the process, I try to scrape along the cob because within this cob is this magical, creamy, milky liquid that really makes the finished dish wonderful. All right, I've got all the corn in a bowl. And now for the fun part, the butter, of course. Now, I'm gonna add about two sticks of butter to this amount of corn. But don't be alarmed, for the amount of people we're feeding, two sticks of butter really isn't that much. I sound kind of defensive, don't I? <laughs> the great thing about this casserole is that you can make it ahead of time, and I love things you can make ahead of time. You can do it early in the day and keep it in the fridge, or you can do it right before, and then it just bakes in the oven while the guests arrive. Now I've got a pint of cream. I'll add almost the whole thing. <laughs> this is just a very old, very classic recipe in this part of the country because fresh corn is abundant. All right, I've got plenty of salt and pepper. And then I've got some pretty finely diced red bell peppers and some finely diced jalapenos. And I thought the jalapenos would give it a nice spice and spicy and party go hand in hand, I think. Now I've got two big buttered casserole dishes over here. And I'll just evenly distribute. Make sure it's nice and stirred before you add it in. Now it doesn't look like the corn has a lot of liquid, but as it cooks, the butter will melt, the corn will give off liquid, the cream will mix with the butter, and it just turns into this magical, delicious substance. It goes in about a 350 degree oven for 20 to 30 minutes until it's bubbly. It's almost party time. And no parties complete around here without a fresh corn casserole. I'm cooking two dinners tonight. You heard me. One here at the lodge and one down at my house. Lad and I wanted to have his brother Tim, his wife Missy, and the kids over for dinner tonight. And it was all planned. I'm gonna make steaks and potatoes. But then the kids kind of cooked up an alternate plan and decided that they wanted to all have dinner down at our house. I thought it'd be fun, so I'm gonna whip up some baked ziti to take down to the kids for dinner, and then I'll move forward with dinner for Tim and Missy. All right, I had some onions and garlic browning in a pan and I just added a pound each of ground beef and Italian sausage. And I'm just gonna break this up as it browns. It already smells so good. Since I was planning steak and potatoes for Tim and Missy, I didn't think it would be feasible for me to make that at both locations. So I kinda looked in the fridge and pantry to see what I had, and this baked ziti just jumped right out at me. Honestly, once I started thinking about it, I thought, I don't think Tim, Missy, Lad, and I have ever had dinner, just the four of us. We've always had the kids around, so it's kind of a novel concept. I hope we can find things to talk about. <laughs> okay, the meat is totally browned. I'll add a 28 ounce can of whole tomatoes, juice and all, and then a couple of regular cans of tomato sauce. 
You can also do jarred marinara sauce if you have that. Either one will work. And then just to give it a little spice, I know the six Drummond kids can handle it. Some crushed red pepper flakes. And then about a teaspoon of Italian seasoning. I love this baked ziti. Anytime I have to feed a bunch of people, I whip it up. Then a little salt and pepper. Okay, now I'll just let the meat sauce simmer for about 25 to 30 minutes to make sure it's really flavorful. And while it simmers, I'll whip up the cheese mixture for the baked ziti. So the first cheese is ricotta, just a tub. The next is mozzarella. I'll grate a pound and a half and add about two cups, keeping the rest for later. And I'll also grate half a cup of Parmesan and add it in with the other cheeses. Next, it's two eggs, two tablespoons of minced parsley, some salt, and pepper. And then I'll just stir it together a couple of times. Okay, the cheese mixture's all combined. Now I'll get the pasta in to cook. I'm using a pound of ziti pasta. You can do penne, mastacholi, any short pasta is just fine. Just pour it in. All right, now I'll just let the pasta cook for about 10 minutes until it's done. Now the baked ziti elements are all ready, so I'll start by assembling it. Now first, I'm gonna take about three cups of the sauce out of the pot, and I'm taking it out just so it'll cool down a little bit. All right, stir it around. I'll show you what I'm gonna do with this here in a sec. Now the pasta is all cooked. I rinsed it under cold water because I wanted it to stop cooking and I'm just gonna pour it into the bowl with the delicious cheese mixture, and then I'll stir this so the pasta gets coated in all that wonderful ricotta, all that mozzarella. Okay, now the sauce should be slightly cooled, so I'll pour it right in with the pasta and the cheese. Now the purpose of this is just to give the cheese-coated pasta a little bit of a coating of sauce without totally drowning it yet. Okay, this looks great. You don't want to totally mix it together. You still want to have some big chunks of cheese in there. Now I'll start the layering process. I'll add half of the pasta into this dish, and then I'll spread it all into an even layer. Now I'll top the pasta with half of the sauce. The sauce looks so good. It's been bubbling away. It's really dark and rich looking. You could just boil up some pasta Top it with this, that'd be a great dinner too. Okay, now I'll just spread the sauce into an even layer. Now on top of the sauce, I'll add a little more grated mozzarella. And then I'll start the whole process again. And this is going to be the perfect dinner for those six Drummond kids. I'm just gonna cover it with foil. Then I'll grab the salad out of the fridge and run all this down to my house. Are you reading your history? Yes, I am. <gasps> wow, what a beautiful sight that is. <laughs> okay, I brought you dinner, so I'm gonna put you in charge. Okay. The baked CD goes in 375 degree oven until it's bubbly, so like 25 minutes or so. Okay. okay so Have fun. Thanks. Call me if anything wild happens. Okay, I will. Bye, Alex. <laughs> Bye. Okay, guys, pass your plates down and I'll serve you up. There we go. Okay, pass that down. Can you serve me up some salad? Okay, guys, dig in. Do you guys like it? Yeah. I was really hungry. Do you guys like having dinner without our parents? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we have full control. Broccoli rice casserole is a cherished Thanksgiving staple. I started by sauteing some finely minced onion with a little bit of garlic in butter. It's nice and soft. So I'm gonna move forward with making a scrumptious sauce. I'm gonna thicken it up with flour, about a fourth a cup. And I let the flour cook just a little bit. 
So I'm gonna add half a teaspoon of mustard powder and a quarter teaspoon of cayenne pepper. So I'll stir those in. Ooh, that cayenne, I kinda got a little whiff of it. So now I've got three cups of whole milk. I'm gonna turn the heat up just a little bit and I'll stir the onion and flour mixture while I pour in the milk. Now I need to let this heat up and it's gonna bubble up and thicken. That'll take about three minutes. Amazing. I'm gonna make the sauce a little more creamy by adding some cream cheese. I'm gonna kind of break it up as I add it. I'm gonna add some grated Parmesan. Okay, that is looking good. So I'll grab some salt and pepper. And I like to add quite a bit of pepper. You really can't add too much pepper. At least in my neck of the woods, you can't. And I've got some paprika, and I'll just add about half a teaspoon. So I'll mix that in. So much flavor. Okay, now the cheeses for broccoli rice casserole are very important. You've got to start with good old processed cheese. I cut it into cubes. There is nothing creamier than this cheese when you add it to a sauce. Now I've got some freshly grated sharp cheddar, and I'm gonna add about a cup and a half, and I'll save the rest to go over the casserole when it goes into the oven. So you're probably wondering, well, what about the broccoli? That goes in now. I've got eight small heads, Make sure all that broccoli is coated in the cheesy goodness. Okay, it's pretty thick, but that's exactly what you want. So I'm gonna add some sliced pimentos. Pimentos are something I have in my pantry all the time because there are so many casseroles that I'll just kind of add a jar to. This is really looking perfect. So I'll turn off the heat, and now it's time to assemble the casserole, which is so much fun. I've got some cooked long grain rice, and I'm gonna add half of this bowl to the casserole. Spread out the rice, and then half of this luscious broccoli cheese sauce goes in, and then the rest of the rice goes on. The rest of the sauce, and the rest of the grated sharp cheddar. Mm-mm. Now I'm gonna put this into the oven at 350 degrees for 30 minutes. I'm gonna be heading to church soon, and I cannot wait, because that means I'm gonna to get to eat this beautiful broccoli rice casserole at the potluck. How good does this look? I cannot recommend this enough. I'll tell you something. I made that casserole at last year's church potluck. I made it this year, and I'll probably make it next year too. There's one more thing I wanna tell you about it. It is absolutely gorgeous to serve up. You dive in, and at this point, words fail me. Mmm, it looks so good. Obviously, at a potluck, there'd be a lot more food to go with it, but I just wanted to show you its deliciousness. The star of the show is a chicken tortilla casserole. It's really hearty and just dripping with all the things my family loves. I've just got some onions in the skillet with a little olive oil, and I just threw them in to get them a little soft before I move forward. I love this casserole. It's really hearty. It's actually a version of a casserole my friend Pastor Ryan used to make. It was sort of a Mexican lasagna. It's just full of deliciousness. All right, the onions are already getting nice and soft, so I'll add in some garlic, several cloves, and I just minced it really fine. And then I'll add some spices couple of teaspoons of chili powder, a teaspoon of paprika, beautiful color, and a teaspoon of ground cumin, which I love to put in so many of my Tex-Mex recipes. Now I'll just stir it, and I want those spices to really coat the onions. I don't want the tomatoes to completely fall apart, and that's why I wait until the onions have started to soften before I add them in. Now I'm just gonna stir them around and let them cook for a couple of minutes. Now the tomato mixture could not look any more delicious and it smells divine. I'm gonna go ahead and get it out of the pan 
This adds such amazing flavor to the casserole. I just love it. Now I'm gonna crank the heat up on the stove, drizzle in a little olive oil, and I'll move on with the next step. There are a lot of steps and a lot of ingredients to this casserole, but nothing is complicated at all. I've got some boneless, skinless chicken breasts, and I just cut them into bite-sized pieces. And I'm gonna season them with the same seasonings I used for the onion mixture. This chicken could not look any more glorious. I'm gonna move forward and make a sauce out of this. And all I need to do is add a little water. And then I'll just stir the chicken around. Now the sauce just needs to bubble up and reduce a bit. Now to add to the chicken, I've got some pinto beans and kidney beans. I just drained them and rinsed them. And they'll just make the filling of the casserole that much more hearty. I'll just pour half of the jar of salsa verde all over the bottom of this casserole dish. I'll start with a layer of six. They'll overlap and cover the bottom of the pan just perfectly. Now, I've just got some plain cooked rice, just regular long grain white rice, and I'm just putting it in a single layer on top of the tortillas. Nothing fancy about this. Now, what makes it fancy is this delicious tomato mixture I made, and I'll just sprinkle it over the rice. This is such an easy recipe. You can use frozen corn if that's what you got. If you have a little extra time, you can shave kernels off of the corn and use fresh. Anything works. All right, now it's time for this delicious chicken and bean mixture. It's been cooling and it looks so good. This is adding all the protein to the dish. I'll just sprinkle it on. and spread it out. And I'll just pour on a nice layer. Mm -mm. I'm gonna make sure it gets in the cracks. And then I'll add the rest of the jar of salsa verde. Just kind of go in between. Ooh, I love this mix. And then half of the cheese goes on. I love putting all the cheese toward the top because as it bakes in the oven, it just drips down into the cracks and makes it so gooey. All right, and then a second layer of corn tortillas. These sort of hold the whole casserole together. It has a base and a top. Now I'll end with a good layer of the homemade enchilada sauce. I'm not gonna use all of this for this casserole, but this sauce keeps in a jar in the fridge. And then the rest of the cheese. <laughs> you have got to have a hearty appetite when you eat this dish. All right, the casserole is all assembled. Now I'm just gonna cover it with foil and keep it in the fridge until I head home. Then tonight, all I have to do is bake it at 375 degrees for 20 minutes. Take the foil off and cook it for another 15 to 20 minutes. Then when it's hot and bubbly, it's done. I'll let it sit a while so it'll hold up together when I serve it. Then everyone gets a great big helping with some sour cream on the side and a sprig of cilantro. The guys are having a big morning of working cattle over on Tim's ranch today, and I'm making them a rib stickin' ranch style lunch. They are gonna be hungry when they're finished. To go with the ribs, I'm making twice-baked potato casserole. It's pretty much everything that's wonderful about twice-baked potatoes, but in casserole form. Now, of course, twice-baked potatoes in any form have to have bacon, so I fried up a bunch, and I just need to chop it up. You know, you can use store-bought bacon bits for twice-baked potatoes, but I think nothing is like bacon you fry yourself, particularly when you're cooking for cowboys. They detect things like this. <laughs> they might run me out of town if they find out I used artificial bacon pieces. Okay, I got the bacon all chopped. I'll let that sit for a sec. Now I've gotta add a lot of butter to this casserole because I baked a lot of potatoes. So I've got four sticks of softened butter. I want it to be really, really soft. Then when the warm potato mixture goes in, it melts really quickly. Okay, and four. And a whole container of sour cream. Everyone likes sour cream with potatoes, let's face it. 
Okay, now for the potatoes. I've got 16 big baking potatoes and I rubbed them in a little bit of vegetable oil and then baked them at 400 for about an hour. They're nice and tender, very hot. So I'll just cut it in half. Ooh, nice and hot. And I'll use a little towel so it won't be too hot in my hands. And I like to use just a big tablespoon to slowly scrape the insides out. Okay, that's the last potato scooped and I've got nice little flecks of potato skin all throughout. So now I'll season all of this. It's a lot of potato. So it needs a good amount of salt and of course plenty of black pepper. And then I also like to add some seasoned salt. It just adds a few different flavors, a little bit of extra saltiness. All right, that looks great. Now I'll throw in all of this delicious bacon. Okay, now the green onions go in. I also grated a lot of cheese, a couple of cups of Cheddar Jack, and I'll sprinkle that over the top. And then I definitely need some milk in here so that everything will mix together well. So I'll just pour in a couple of cups of milk. All right, now I just need to break out my mussels. I've got a potato masher and I'll just go right in and smush all this together. This takes a little while. There are a lot of ingredients in here. The potatoes don't have to be completely smooth, but I don't want there to be any huge chunks. Okay, looks perfect. Get the extra off. Now I'm gonna put all of this into a big foil container. I think it'll all fit. Whenever I'm making twice baked potatoes for a crowd, it can get a little much to refill the skins after the mixture is done. This is the perfect solution. Just put it into a big pan, warm it up, and it's ready to serve. This looks amazing. There is not a cowboy on the ranch or a kid on the ranch that won't go crazy for this. Okay, now I'll just smooth out the surface. Doesn't have to be perfect. This is a great dish to make if you're having a big party because you can actually make it the day ahead and pop it in the oven when you're ready. I wasn't that organized. <laughs> I did it the same day. Okay, now I'm gonna sprinkle more cheese over the top. The potato mixture has plenty inside, but I like for the top to have a nice layer of melted cheese. This is Cheddar Jack, but you can use all cheddar, all jack, or you could do pepper jack. That's always delicious too. Okay, now this just needs to go back into the oven for about 30 minutes until it's warmed through. Cheesy twice baked potato casserole. Here are the ribs. Did you guys work up an appetite? I'm gonna go by dead. Todd, you want some potatoes? What's up? Get the good stuff. I'm making a tater tot casserole for tomorrow. It is so wonderful. It's an all-in-one main course. It's got a great shortcut ingredient. And it's make ahead. Check, check, and check. I'm gonna assemble the casserole today and bake it tomorrow. I'm just browning some breakfast sausage with some finely diced onion. I'm gonna let the sausage cook all the way through. And while it does, I'm gonna grab that shortcut ingredient. Frozen tater tots. So easy. All I need to do is get them into a buttered baking dish. This perfect layer of tater tots is gonna to get topped with the brown sausage and onions. And it's fine that this is hot. It's gonna have a chance to cool down before I add the other ingredients. Once the casserole bakes, those tater tots just turn into potatoes. You would never know they were frozen. Okay, that is all the sausage. Now I'll start working on the egg mixture. This casserole has a lot of cheese, so I'm gonna grate up some cheddar and some Monterey Jack. It's probably the cheese combination that I use the most in my kitchen. Okay, that's enough cheddar. I'll start grating the pepper jack. Love pepper jack cheese, it's so creamy and I love the spice. Okay, that's it for the cheese. Get it out of here. I've got four eggs that I cracked into the pitcher and I'll add a cup of milk. It's whole milk just to make the whole thing a little more rich. And speaking of rich, a little bit of half and half, just about half a cup or so. 
Now the sausage is really flavorful and plenty salty, but I'm gonna add just a little bit of seasoned salt, about a quarter teaspoon. And for some spice, a little cayenne pepper. Really simple. And then I'll whisk this together. Okay, that is nice and mixed. So I'll add some green and red bell pepper. I seeded it and pulled out the membranes and then I diced them really fine. Okay, the last thing to add to the egg mixture is half of this cheese. The other half is gonna go on top of the casserole. I'll give it a quick stir. And then this beautiful concoction gets poured over the sausage, which is cool by now. And look at all that chunky wonderfulness. Make sure it's all even. And then the rest of this cheese goes on top. This is a cheesy, cheesy dish. Now I've just got to cover it with foil, stash it in the fridge overnight, and tomorrow when it comes to baking and serving, well, that's going to be a cinch. I'll get the casserole into the oven at 350 degrees for 25 minutes. Then I'll take the foil off and bake it for another 20 minutes. Then when it's hot and bubbling, I'll get it out and onto the counter. And everyone will have a lovely hearty helping. Oh boy, check out all the tater tots and sausagey, oniony, eggy cheesiness. Mmm, fantastic.